Many questions remain unanswered and many more have been raised since the first letter was written. So many contradictions continue to surface and yet they appear to be totally overlooked. Whether they are selectively obscured behind a veil of closely guarded secrets or simply not recognised is too difficult to know but one thing is for certain and that is when the truth is told there is only one story. We have a three-year-old vanish without a trace. We have a photo of him that was allegedly taken just moments before his disappearance, which placed him on the deck of the foster grandmother's house in Kendall. We have half a cup of tea and a four-year-old's testimony, and then what? Stories, stories, and more stories. Some true, some false, some to deceive, and some to totally confuse. To quote Chopper Reed, why let the truth get in the way of a good story? No number of fabricated stories or biases are going to solve this case. From the beginning, we have had certain suspects held in higher regard than others. This may have created a blind spot, which has rippled out and distorted the view of what really happened on the day that William went missing. Could it be that many of the avenues that may have yielded results were not followed. It came to the public's attention via a podcast that when officials were asked about the foster father's statement, the response was, we don't have one. William was at the grandmother's house in the care of the foster parents when he went missing and there is no statement from the foster father. Isn't that a little unusual? Maybe the walkthrough of the foster grandmother's property six days later with the detective and the foster father could be considered a statement. The answers to these questions remain in the dark, but what is known is that we have already been told that both foster parents made a formal written statement a couple of days after William went missing. And in their statement, they detail the stops along the way and exactly what happened on their trip to Kendall. So, if the statement was taken as stated, then where has it gone? And if there was no statement taken, then why have we been told that there was? Many questions remain unanswered, like with the cars parked in Benaroon Drive. When reconsidering this possibility, it does not seem feasible or does it even make sense that these two cars went unnoticed. The foster mother tells us that she first saw the two cars when she awoke and went out onto the balcony. She also tells us that she saw them later that morning when she was out playing with William in the yard. It seems baffling that the truth of this story has yet to be highlighted. This is not just about a memory lapse. It makes no difference if it took her two days or six days to remember. So bring in the experts to tell us the obvious. Yes, we can all forget things in all situations, including a crisis. This is about two cars that were parked for at least one and a half, possibly two hours on Benaroon Drive, just up from Allendale Crescent, and they were not sighted by anyone. Let's calculate. The foster mother saw the cars from the balcony between 7 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. We can now jump ahead to when the foster father leaves the foster grandmother's house to go into town for a conference call. We are told that he leaves the house between 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Either time doesn't matter. It gives us a general idea of when he left the foster grandmother's house to go to Lakewood or Laurenton. Both town names are given, but again, it makes no difference to the point that is being made here. What does matter, however, is that 9am is also the time given when the foster mother takes William and his sister outside to ride their bikes in the driveway. So already we have a time lapse of at least one and a half hours since the foster mother first saw the two cars on Benaroon Drive. We often see it reported like this. William's foster mother has told police that she recalled seeing two cars outside her mother's house on the morning of the 12th of September 2014, just a few hours before William went missing. A few hours before William went missing, 
What is she talking about? William went missing at around 10.30 a.m. And if the foster mother last saw these cars a few hours prior to William going missing, then she is claiming to have last seen these cars at 7.30 a.m. Is this another of those forgetful moments? We know, according to the foster mother, that between 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., another vehicle, described as a dark green grey sedan, showed up. The lead detective tells us that it was about 9 a.m. when the foster mother was outside with William and his sister, who were riding their bikes in the driveway, and the dark green greyish coloured sedan showed up. It nosed into the neighbour's driveway, reversed and drove back down Benaroon Drive. It would be interesting to ask how the lead detective would know this to be true or anything else in this case to be true for that matter. To be assessed, to be accurate, without evidence proves nothing. According to the foster mother story, at one point there must have been all three cars all at the same time in Benaroon Drive. How do I know this? I know this because the foster mother tells me. And then, um, the next time I saw those cars, uh, William and I were playing um, in the garden and we were playing chasings and things like that. And I remember just looking over my, I don't know, I just remember having this, this feeling and looking over um, my shoulder and they were still there. And I looked a bit closer, and I don't, I don't think, I couldn't see anybody inside. But I remember looking at these cars, thinking, why are they still there? And the driver's windows were down, and I'm thinking they're so close together. And it was really odd because in the whole time that Mum and Dad have lived at Kendall, there has never ever been cars parked on that street. Ever. If these cars were still there, as we were just told by the foster mother, and she saw them for the second time when playing Chasey with William in the yard, and we know that it wasn't until after 9am that she went outside into the yard, then we can assume that according to the foster mother that the two cars were still parked in Benaroon Drive after 9am. Once outside, William and his sister rode their bikes in the driveway, where William's sister noticed and pointed out to the foster mother the dark green grey coloured sedan. After a while, they all went back inside and we are told that about 10 minutes had passed and the foster mother and William went back outside and were playing chasey. It was when the foster mother was playing Chasey that she noticed that the two cars she had first seen at about 7.30 were still there. So, we can now determine that anyone leaving that area between 7.30am to around 9.30am would have been able to notice them also, but did they? We have heard neighbours speak of either going to town or returning from town between 7.30am to 9.30am. How many of them have come forth as a witness to verify the foster mother's claim? There may be a perfectly good explanation why the foster mother is seeing things that no one else is, but as yet, this has not been explained. Usually, before anything gets thoroughly looked at, it appears to be brushed away with excuses and stories of loving foster parents, which only reinforces a blind spot that was being referred to earlier. Well, let's ask the foster father if he's seen the two cars he would have driven straight past them on his way into town. Such realisations leave you questioning if there is any actual genuine desire to find the truth. According to the foster mother, seeing the two cars parked in Benaroon Drive was an extremely rare occurrence. From never ever having cars parked in that street ever and for the cars to show up on the very morning that William went missing is mind blowing in the least. Many of the contradictions are still being held up as if to demonstrate the truth, but it is glaringly obvious that they are not. Take the interview that depicts a detective strolling around the foster grandmother's yard with the foster father. It clearly demonstrates that the foster mother is within close proximity to the foster father when she makes a call to the triple O operator. 
The detective asks, at what point? Who called the police? The foster father responds and we hear him say beep, which is referring to the foster mother. The detective asks the foster father, was there a discussion at all between yourself and Beep? The foster father responds, I saw her on the phone and I think she, I think she said, should I call the police? Foster father tells the detective, I said call the police, call the police. Detective asks, where were you? Foster father responds, I was in this paddock, somewhere here. She, I've looked at her, this has all taken place in the paddock. So by this conversation, it can be determined that the foster mother was outside with the foster father in the paddock when she made the triple O call to the operator. Then we have the foster mother's version of events and she gives us a completely different story, which is, I went back down with one of the neighbors and we kept looking and we kept looking down to the bus stop and back all through the houses. And then I thought, okay, I've got to call triple O. And that's when I went back upstairs and I made that call. Police emergency, this is Simone. This contradiction may be missed among the many because it seems that nowhere online can the original police interview be found. The police interview that is posted for online viewing appears to be missing the ending. It finishes before the foster father speaks of the triple O call that he claimed he discussed with his wife in the paddock. Then we have the version from the inquest. We are told that after searching down Benaroon Drive that the foster mother went to the house to get a phone. It was then that she saw the text message from the male foster father and at about the same time he drove into the driveway. She raced out and said, is William with you? This could suggest that she was about to use her mobile phone, although it has also been stated that she ran upstairs and grabbed the portable landline phone to make the call on. How do we determine which one of these three versions, if any, are true? None of these contradictions tell us what happened to William, but they do, however, confuse and arouse enough suspicion to realise that something isn't quite right. Did this happen or that? Did it take place here or there? Was it early or late? It is like a game of pin the tail on the donkey and where it lands, nobody knows. We can, however, ascertain by the evidence that we have been given and the statements that the foster mother has made that she had forgotten, not once or twice, but on numerous occasions, only to tell us sometimes days, sometimes weeks later, what she had not been able to recall on the day that we went missing. The foster mother told the inquest that she drove left out of Benaroon Drive to look for William at the riding school. So she obviously forgot that the riding school in 2014 was a turn to the right out of Benaroon Drive. She forgot how she had heard what she thought was a scream coming from the bush in Batar Creek Road. And we are given the impression that the scream was heard closer to the grandmother's house. She did not recall the two cars parked suspiciously with their driver windows down on Benaroon Drive until two days later. In the 2019 inquest, she had forgotten that she had recalled the cars two days after William went missing and tells us she now recalled them six days later. She had forgotten about the dark green, greyish coloured sedan that had nosed into the driveway, reversed back out and drove slowly past William's foster grandmother's house. She had forgotten all about the suspicious cars in the area when prompted by the triple O operator. She had forgotten that she had told us that she couldn't see any occupants in the car that nosed into the driveway and then gives us an extremely detailed description of the so-called occupant that she was initially unable to see and so on and so on and so on. If these sort of discrepancies showed up with any of the other suspects, it would arouse a great deal of suspicion and be all over the headlines. There is a huge difference in comparison. This is a strange case indeed.